All right, now up to the third floor exhibits where the best stuff is. That is General John J. Pershing's desk and chair from his headquarters, while commander of the American Expeditionary Forces in France, also his inkwell telephone and other artifacts he used there. This exhibit is The Price of Freedom, Americans at War, about the wars the U.S. has been involved in. These are colonial guns from around the time of the French and Indian War. This is a puppet theater. These were popular at the time of the revolution for use as political satire. As shown here is a confrontation over taxes on tea. A British soldier occupying a home without consent of the owner, which the US abolished in the Third Amendment. And this is absolutely incredible. This is General George Washington's waistcoat, breeches, and regimental coat that he wore in the 1780s and 90s. Also the epaulets from the general's uniform. This is George Washington at Princeton by Charles Wilson Peale. The other copy of this portrait is in Indianapolis. Common people who were so upset by British policies that they decided to fight the most powerful military in the world fought the revolution. The uniform of Colonel Peter Gansevoort, who commanded the successful resistance to the siege of Fort Stanwix. A tea table from Mount Vernon and Washington's eyeglasses. And that is George Washington's sword. He had it while commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. This is the Ansbach Beirut regimental flag. That was a stubborn German regiment that surrendered at Yorktown. Major General Benjamin Lincoln's sword and scabbard. He accepted the surrender of one British regiment at Yorktown. This shows the American and French positions at Yorktown. Rochambeau's navy blocking out the York River mouth. These candlesticks were in the room where the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783, taken by Peace Commissioner John Jay as a souvenir. And this is General Andrew Jackson's uniform, sword, and scabbard from the War of 1812. He led a major victory at New Orleans against the British after the war had ended, and he became widely popular and later president. Here are some artifacts from the war for Texas independence between Texans and Mexico, as well as a cannon used in the Mexican-American War. A slave collar, as well as a carbine and pike used by John Brown's raiders, who led an anti-slavery attack on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in 1859. A Zouave uniform, the 5th New York Volunteer Infantry in the Civil War, had a uniform based off the French Zouaves, which comprised of native Algerians. The Civil War lasted from April 1861 to April 1865 between the United States and the Confederate States of America as the southern states had seceded and created a new nation. And these are all artifacts from the Civil War, including many rifles and battle flags. This is a surgeon's kit. If you got shot in the leg or arm and survived, you got sawed off with no anesthesia. A tree stump with battle damage from Spotsylvania Courthouse, Virginia. This is the frock coat worn by General George McClellan at Antietam, the bloodiest single day of the war. A rifle and model of the USS Carondelet, which was part of the Siege of Vicksburg. These are all artifacts from Gettysburg, the bloodiest but arguably most important battle of the Civil War. A camp chair and field glass of General Ulysses S. Grant. A bunch of different Civil War outfits and uniforms. These are the chairs and table used at the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox Courthouse. Lee sat in the caned armchair, Grant in the upholster chair. And this is Reinze, also known as Winchester, the stuffed horse of General Sheridan. He died in 1878, but was taxidermied. A little exhibit on the Spanish-American War, which happened after the USS Maine blew up. Even though it was probably an accident, it was an excuse for an imperial war. These are artifacts from World War I, which was fought by Americans in a mostly European conflict. 
That is Sergeant Stubby, the most decorated dog of the Great War. The Pitbull experienced 17 major battles on the Western Front and became a celebrity. From my understanding, that is a model of Sergeant Stubby, but his ashes are inside. Clark Gable's Army Air Force's uniform from World War II. World War II was the largest war in world history, and the US was at war on two fronts, with the Nazis and Axis powers in Europe and Africa, along with the Empire of Japan in the Pacific. A rocket launcher, mine, and some helmets. A wool overcoat worn in the Battle of the Bulge. The uniforms of women in the war. Some were nurses, others held some military roles. Uniforms from the Korean War. And now we get into the Cold War, which dominated global politics in the decades after World War II. This is a Huey used in the long and controversial Vietnam War. Fifty-eight thousand Americans were killed in the Vietnam War, along with millions of others, including a large number of civilians. This M1 rifle was with the Guardsmen when the Kent State University protest shooting happened. It was impounded as evidence. American uniforms and artifacts from the Vietnam War. And these are uniforms and artifacts of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army. I think that's a big fake piece of the Berlin Wall with a few small slabs from the real thing. General Colin Powell and General Norman Schwarzkopf's uniforms from the Persian Gulf War. These are two large steel fragments of the World Trade Center recovered after the 9-11 attack. Uniforms from the Iraq War, which is still going on 17 years later. And some drone and robot equipment that have been used in Afghanistan. This is the Gunboat Philadelphia, a vessel used by the Continental Army in the American Revolution. It was built under command of General and later Trader Benedict Arnold in 1776 at Fort Ticonderoga. This ship saw combat with the British on October 11th, 1776. This ship and seven other similar gunboats were heavily outnumbered and lost. The Philadelphia was hit and sank, but the battle did keep the British back in New England until the next year, which gave the Continental Army more critical time to prepare. This is the First Lady's Exhibit, and that is Eleanor Roosevelt's inaugural gown from 1933. Indiana's First Lady Caroline Scott Harrison's evening gown. This was made of materials all from the US following her husband's America First economic policy. Nancy Reagan's suit that she wore at the 1980 Republican National Convention. Nancy brought some old Hollywood to the White House with her. These are Lou Henry Hoover's dresses. And this is Jackie Kennedy's state dinner dress. Jackie was a fashion icon and had a lot of expensive clothing, but she was really intelligent and cared a lot about historical preservation. The three dresses in the back belong to Frances Folsom Cleveland, Julia Dent Grant's evening gown, which was a gift from the Emperor of China, Edith Bowling Wilson's evening dress, she was the second first lady of Woodrow Wilson. This is the reception gown of Lucy Webb Hayes. Mammy Dowd Eisenhower's evening gown, purse, and shoes. Grace Coolidge's very 20s looking evening gowns. 
These are pretty amazing. Dolly Madison's dresses that have survived all this time. She was very politically active in Washington after her husband's death, and the dress on the right is from that time. She also is famous for saving the portrait of George Washington from the White House when the British were burning it. Lady Bird Johnson's inaugural gown and coat from 1965. That is Mary Todd Lincoln's Purple Velvet Ensemble, and it is believed to have been made by an African-American dressmaker. The coffee and tea set was owned by Mary Todd Lincoln. Because of her husband's assassination and many past troubles, she had developed some mental issues that made her son put her in an insane asylum. It has been tradition for first ladies to design White House China, and here are some originals. Edith Roosevelt's inaugural gown from 1905 and a concert chair used at the White House from Theodore Roosevelt's administration to the Kennedy's administration. Betty Ford's state dinner dress on the left and Rosalind Carter's inaugural gown on the right. Nancy Reagan's inaugural gown from 1981. Barbara Bush's inaugural gown from 1989. Hillary Clinton's inaugural gown from 1993. She is also the only first lady to almost become president. Laura Bush's inaugural gown, by the way, she killed someone. Michelle Obama's inaugural gown from 2009. I miss her. And this is the current First Lady, Melania Trump's inaugural gown from 2017. And now the finale, the American Presidency, a glorious burden that has one of the best collections of presidential artifacts. Ulysses S. Grant's carriage that he purchased while president, he rode it to his second inauguration. It wasn't in this carriage, but Grant got a speeding ticket while president. That is first president George Washington's portable writing case used during the revolution as well as a field telescope that he used in the war. These are original furnishings from the presidential mansion in Philadelphia, the home Washington lived in. Washington supposedly worked on his important and precedent-setting farewell address by the light of this candelabrum. President Grover Cleveland's overcoat and top hat that he wore at his first inauguration in 1885. He had two non-consecutive terms. That is General Dwight D. Eisenhower's uniform that he wore while Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in World War II. Bill Clinton's football, aka the briefcase, aka it contained the nuclear codes. There's a lot of ceremony behind the presidency. That is Nixon's redesigned uniform for the Secret Service Uniform Division because he was impressed by some European guards. Beaded pouch given to U.S. Grant at an Indian peace conference. I don't think any peace came out of that. This silver junk was presented to Theodore Roosevelt by the Empress of China after their forced acceptance of open door policy. And that is a folder from the Camp David summit in which President Jimmy Carter held a peace talk between Israeli Prime Minister Begin and Egyptian President Sadat to end their war. At the top is a land grant signed by James Monroe, and this is a patent for a washing machine signed by President Andrew Jackson. Thomas Jefferson's polygraph, its pens created simultaneous copies of a writer's manuscript. Eisenhower's reading copy of his 1960 State of the Union address 
with last minute notes and underlines. James K. Polk used this ivory handled letter seal in the White House, Eisenhower's desk plate, Chester A. Arthur's pen stand, and his blank telegram forms. These are the original Leonard Volk hand casts of Abraham Lincoln from 1860. I've seen many replicas of these, but these are the actual casts, and the stick piece there was actually held by Lincoln when making them. A William McKinley support poster, he got assassinated. Buttons protesting Reagan's firing of air traffic controllers for striking. Of course, in the 1970s, there was the big oil crisis, so here's a protest sign from Nixon's time in office. The chaps of Theodore Roosevelt that he wore during his days in the Dakota Territory. Franklin D. Roosevelt's microphone that he used for some fireside chats. That is a pocket compass used by William Clark on the Lewis and Clark expedition, one of few artifacts remaining from it. The pen used by President Lyndon B. Johnson to sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. And that is Alan Shepard's spacesuit that he wore on the first US manned mission to space. He wasn't president, but that's here for some reason. The chair of three-time presidential loser Henry Clay, whose service in the House of Representatives and Senate was far more historic and important than most presidents. Also a straw hat that belonged to Clay and an 1843 portrait. These desks were used in the House of Representatives from 1857 to 1873. Also this one is used by the hanging judge, Isaac Parker. The robe of Chief Justice William Rehnquist that he wore during sessions of the Supreme Court and also Bill Clinton's impeachment trial. This is a filing cabinet of the doctor of Daniel Ellsberg who leaked the Pentagon Papers. It was opened by a crowbar by the plumbers who would eventually break into the Watergate. A silk dress worn by Jackie Kennedy who wore it to a reception for Latin American diplomats and leaders of Congress. Some old pieces of the White House, which has undergone many extensions and renovations over the years. Some presidential Christmas cards and Easter eggs from the annual Easter egg roll. There have been some presidential weddings at the White House, usually after the first First Lady died. John Tyler, Grover Cleveland, and Woodrow Wilson have been married while president. A paint set used by Archie Roosevelt, the son of Theodore Roosevelt, and a dollhouse from 1896 given to Grover Cleveland's children. Creepy doll of John Quincy Adams' granddaughter, and a dollhouse Woodrow Wilson gave to his granddaughter. A chessboard used by John Quincy Adams. Love this, Bill Clinton's saxophone. Herbert Hoover's fishing reel, Grover Cleveland's trout flies and coins collected by Eisenhower, Barack Obama's basketball, he had a basketball court put into the White House. That is Harry S. Truman's amazing shirt that he would wear at the Little White House in Key West. And these are a pair of Warren G. Harding's silk pajamas. Another aspect of presidents featured in the exhibit is dying in office. The first was William Henry Harrison in 1841. He died because he contracted pneumonia after giving this very long inaugural address in the cold and rain without a coat. He died exactly one month into office. Zachary Taylor died in 1850 from the stomach flu. The Mexican War hero probably drank some water or tea with bad bacteria in it, which eventually killed him. 
Abraham Lincoln attended a play at Ford's Theater in D.C. just five days after General Lee's surrender, but was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth and died on April 15, 1865. That is Abraham Lincoln's iconic top hat, and the last time he wore it was when he went to Ford's Theater that fateful night. The band towards the bottom of the hat is actually a mourning band for his son Willie, who died in 1862. Booth was killed 12 days later, maybe, and the Lincoln conspirators were tried and hanged as a key to one of their prison cells and the shackles one of them would have worn. Lincoln's funeral was the largest in American history. It was two weeks long, and the train stopped in many major cities on the way to Springfield, where millions saw the casket. President James A. Garfield was shot by a deranged office seeker on July 2, 1881 and died on September 19th of that year. This is a rail spike from the special railway that was built for him that led to the home he died in in Long Branch, New Jersey. Really, it was the doctors who arguably caused him to die from the gunshot. Alexander Graham Bell used this machine on Garfield to try and locate the bullet, but it was unsuccessful. The Smithsonian also owns the gun, but they don't display it for some reason. William McKinley was shot by an anarchist at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, and died on September 14, 1901. This cup and saucer was used by McKinley shortly before his death. Memorial postcards from the exposition that McKinley died at. Interesting souvenir. And this is the wallet and pen knife that was in McKinley's pockets when he was shot. Warren G. Harding died of a heart attack on August 2nd, 1923 in San Francisco. Potentially, as a conspiracy goes, that he was poisoned by his wife in Alaska. This death may have also been convenient for him, as shortly after his death is when the facts of his administration's widespread corruption started coming out. Franklin D. Roosevelt died at Warm Springs, Georgia on April 12, 1945, shortly before the war in Europe was going to end and the war with Japan was coming to a close. Those are his glasses and case. John F. Kennedy was assassinated by a sniper in Dallas, Texas, an event which really shook the nation. These are one of the muffled drums used in his funeral. This is a game I really want to get a hold of and play. Presidents have become very merchandisable. Also, there's a teddy bear. And here was my favorite childhood toy, the George W. Bush in the box. Maybe that's where my obsessive interest in politics and history came from. Eisenhower's golf bag and clubs that he used at his farm in Gettysburg. The Grants received these objects on their world tour after his presidency. An easy chair from George Washington's Mount Vernon bedroom. He would have sat in it not long before he died. There's Elmo, one of the originals used in Sesame Street. The pop culture and entertainment exhibit was unfortunately closed like it was in 2016, so hopefully next time I'm here, it will finally be open. All right, so that museum is one of the best. Um, there's just so much stuff in there. I could spend days in there. Um, but anyways, if you like this, uh, please subscribe and go watch my other videos, like the ones here in DC. Um, and thanks for watching.